chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. The first 11 verses of Philippians, really they are one paragraph, you know, in our modern way of writing things. One paragraph, and they are really an expression of Paul's heart, the desire of his heart for his life, for himself. He had warned them to watch out for those people that tell you there is more to it than just believing in Jesus and putting your faith and your trust in Jesus and what he did on the cross, shedding his blood, being raised from the dead, that there's more to it. Now that you, now that you receive Jesus, there's more that you need to do to really be saved. So watch out for those people. He even called them dogs, evil workers, mutilators. Because what they were doing was they are saying, well, you're saved, but you know some Jewish laws you need to follow, you need to get circumcised. It's one thing, and you need to follow the law to be saved. Will to add to God the gospel of Jesus Christ. Calls them some pretty, and they were the religious people. Call them some pretty heavy duty names. That was in verse 2 of this chapter. And then in verse 4 through 6, he listed what he had done, the things that he'd done to keep the law better than anyone. That nobody could be equal to him on as far as keeping the law. And he had done it. The Pharisee of Pharisees. But he said in verse 8 that all those good works he did, all those things, and following the law, he says, is nothing but trash, rubbish. The actual word means dog poop. It's works. You know, the Bible says our righteousness, our righteousness, our works, aside from Christ, is rubbish. Listen to what it says in Isaiah chapter 64. Verse 6, it says, For all of us has become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Our righteous deeds, it, it, the word is gross there when he says filthy garments. He's talking about, he's talking about filthy garments. I'm not even going to go there. Anna says, quit saying that in church. It's bad. Then at the verse, in the verse 8 and 9, he says this. He says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And we looked at that last week, and now he wraps it up with verses 10 and 11 in, in Philippians chapter 3, when he says, That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's Paul's goal in life. To know Him. To know Jesus. That's His goal. There are five goals, five things that He says here in these two verses that we're going to look at. And the first one He says is that I may know Him. And the word know, you know, He wanted to know Him better. You, you would think, well, here's Paul. He'd been ministering for 30 years at this time. For 30 years, He'd been on the road ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what does he say? That I may know him. You think he'd know him already? After 30 years of serving him, well, he did know him. But he wanted to know him better. And see, he had an intimate relationship with Jesus, that's for sure. And the word know here, my Greek is terrible, but it's gnosko. It means to be to become known in a personal way. To understand. To know intimately. Personally. You know, there's another word in the New Testament they use for know, and, and it's called oida, and it means to know intellectually. To know about someone. You know, you can study somebody's life, say George Washington or Abraham or somebody, you can study their life, and you can, you can know more about them than anybody. But you don't really know them personally. But you know about them. 
That's not the no he's talking about here. He's talking about personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That I might know Him. That's His heart. That I might know Him. Have you ever prayed that? Lord, that I might know You. Know You better. Or, or do we get satisfied with what we know about Him now? We go to church Sunday, we go to church Wednesdays, and we do this, we live our life. Do you really, really do you pray? Do you want to know Him in that intimate way? I do. I want to know Him better. And the more I read the Word, the more I, I get a little more understanding of who He is. I'm like, wow. You see, many people know about Jesus. Many people know about Jesus, but they don't know Him personally. In fact, more people know about Him than know Him. And you know, Christian growth is not knowing more about Jesus. It's knowing Him personally. Because you can study His life, you can know all about Him. and not even go to heaven. In fact, colleges, they study Him, study Him, study Him, study Him. And they don't even know Him. You know, I've known this Anna for 50 years. That's older than most of you probably in this room. A lot of you. I've known her. I, mean, I know her. I mean, I know about her, but I know her. And I know her more now than I did the first year we were together. 50 years later, I, you know, and, and she knows me. And we can almost, we know what each other is thinking pretty much. Or at least sometimes we think we do. That gets you in trouble when you think you know what somebody else is thinking. The more you get to know Jesus, the closer you get to Him, the more that relationship is developed. You will be blown away. The more you know Him, the more you will be blown away by who He is, what He's done for you. And you start to understand that. Ha ha. Ha The Holy Spirit. As you've been born again, as you've received Jesus in your life, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. And the Holy Spirit is the one who points to Jesus and reveals that knowledge of who He is to you. If you do not have the Holy Spirit living in you, you don't know Jesus. You're never going to know Him in that way. Because it's the Holy Spirit that causes that intimate relationship to develop. For instance, I mean, how do you get to know? You read the Word, and it's, it's the Holy Spirit that brings the Word alive to us. That's why I continually, many times, say that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in you when you believe, but you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Overflowing, asking the Lord to baptize you in the Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Word comes to life to you. Prayer comes to life to you. You're not bored with it. You're not bored going to church. You're not fulfilling your duties by going to church. You want to go to church. Because you want to be with believers. You want to know more about it. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's a difference. <laughs> so you read the Word. You get to know Him. You pray. You speak to Him. You talk to Him. And you fellowship with Him. I fellowship with the Lord all day long. I can't get away from him. I know he's always there, so I can't ignore that. I can't pretend like he's not there and go do, you know, well, uh, you're not here now. He's always with me. And listen. You pray, you fellowship, and you listen. Practicing, I call it practicing his presence. Practicing the presence of God in your life. Practice the presence of Jesus in your life. Because he's there. Always. Every second, every moment, always. He lives in you. You can't get away. As a matter of fact, when the Holy Spirit pops out, leaves this earth, and evil is unleashed, we go with him. He lives in me. I'm going with him. And you fellowship with other believers in Christ. Important. All of these things are important to get to know Christ. So, Paul says here, he says, he says, that I may know Him, and secondly, he says, in the power of His resurrection. The power of His resurrection. You see, Jesus, He laid in the grave. When He was in the grave, guess what? He was dead. He was cold. There was no breath coming out of Him. 
His heart was not beating. He was dead in the grave. And he came to life. That's the power of the resurrection. He came back to life. From being cold, breath of the lungs, and being warm again. He came back to life. That's the power of God working there. That is the life-giving power of God. And that's the same power that he saved you with. You are born again because of that same power. You were resurrected from the dead spiritually. Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 8. You can turn there if you like. Ephesians chapter 2. Once again, Paul speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God's words through him. It says, And you were dead, speaking to us. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too have all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, I, I, you know, I always like to but God. God's got our butts. But God. He said, you know, we were just, we were, we were evil people. There's none righteous. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Don't you like that? By grace you have been saved. And raised up, and he raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the <coughs> ages to come he might show up the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. It was a resurrection, it was a resurrection in our lives when we surrendered finally to the Lord. Take my life, Lord. I'm sick of my sin, Lord. I, I want you. And there was a resurrection in our lives. The Spirit was born again. He took us out of the hands of Satan. He took us out of the from going to hell into going to heaven. That's a resurrection. So you be like Paul and pray. And pray that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And thirdly, and the fellowship of his sufferings. The fellowship of his sufferings? Yeah, I, I, all you're praying that you want to know the fellowship of sufferings is not a, you know, a joyful word, is it? So, you want to suffer? No. Well, you know, fellowship in, in, in the Greek is koinia. It's not a churchy fellowship. It's a spiritual fellowship in Christ. He had said earlier, earlier on in this book, he said, fellowship in the gospel, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have fellowship in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are partakers of his grace together. We fellowship in his grace together. And we have fellowship in the spirit. Fellowship of the spirit. He had said that. You know, those are all good things. But now he says, sufferings. Fellowship in in his sufferings. Ouch! Oh, I, I don't know if I like that. What does that mean? It doesn't sound good, but guess what? It's a blessing. It's a blessing. Look, I don't like pain. I'm not one of those guys, you know, not a, you don't like pain at all. I don't like no, any kind of pain. When I was a kid, I, I'm not afraid anymore, okay? I'm not going to tell you that. Of needles, you know, I'm not. I can get shots now, they don't bother me. But when I was a kid, Man, I thought I thought shots was like it was like you're gonna die. No, oh, you know. I, I don't like pain. Miss Anna will tell you this. Don't listen to her. She says I'm a baby because I'm not. <laughs> you know, this isn't talking about suffering with him for our sins because he took care of that on the cross once and for all. We, you know, we're not. He dealt with that. Never to be remembered again. That's, that's not the kind of suffering for our sins he's talking about. It's more like this in John 15. John 15 verses 18 to 20. It's more like this. What Jesus spoke and he said this. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. 
If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you? A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So you see, in that relationship with him and serving him, when you do that, you invite persecution in your life. It's going to happen. That's what Jesus says. They hated me, they will hate you. They persecuted me, they will persecute you. Well, I know everybody says, well, sign me up. Yeah, right. Wouldn't that be a great message to go out here and tell people out there? You know, if you become, if you become a Christian, you're going to be persecuted and hated. Join the club here. Come and join us. Oh, are you crazy? Without understanding, sounds nuts. Paul, speaking to the believers in Acts, in Acts 14, 22, he says, Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Through many troubles we must enter the kingdom of God. It's, there's going to be troubles along the way. He tells us. And this will be part of it, okay? In 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 and 4, he said, So that no one would have disturbed me by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. It's getting more fun all the time, isn't it? At least nobody's walked out yet. Here's the point. This is, you, you'll like this one. It's an honor and a privilege. The fellowship and the sufferings. What? Pastor Jim, you're, you're, you're crazy. Pretty soon you're going to bring me up, bring us up here and take off your belt and start whipping us. No. You're nuts. No. Listen, Jesus in Matthew 10. In Matthew, chapter, <coughs> Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Jesus says this. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Out of Jesus' mouth, you are blessed when you are persecuted for right. What do you, how do you get persecuted for righteousness' sake? Listen, Christians are persecuted all over the world right now for believing in Jesus. My goodness, I look at my country, the United States of America. Man, they want to take Jesus out of everything. Take the two amount of schools. Downfall of my country. Persecuted. You know you're persecuted when you go and you share Jesus in different places. People laugh at you. I mean, it's all over. You persecute them. Then he goes on to say in Matthew 5, there he says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. You're blessed. You're happy. It's an honor and a privilege. And then he says, rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. They don't like me. <laughs> You're crazy. Rejoice and be glad. Why? Why? For your reward in heaven is great. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It is a privilege. And your reward in heaven is great. Your reward in heaven for being persecuted and suffering for the name of Christ down here in this world will, will be way more than any suffering you did. As a matter of fact, you'll probably get there and say, why did I get more persecution? Because your reward would be so big. It's going to so outweigh. It'd be like this. If you had a scale, you have a scale here, and you put all your persecutions on it, right? It goes, meow. And then you put your reward in heaven. Your reward in heaven, man outweigh it by far. That's why you rejoice. You don't have to rejoice because it hurts. Rejoice, you were persecuted in His name, for His name's sake. And he will, he will take care of you for that. You will be blessed for that. You know, in Acts chapter 5, Peter and the disciples, they were warned time and time again. Stop preaching in the name, this name. Stop preaching. And they got beat, you know, they got... And they were being persecuted like crazy. Remember, this was right after they got filled with the Holy Spirit. And before they got filled with the Holy Spirit, they're hiding out. Now they're out preaching the gospel, and they're, and they're being brought in by the authorities. They're telling them, "Stop it!" Well, 
In Acts chapter 5, verse 33 through 42. Once again, they were out. They were out sharing the gospel. And they were brought in. And these guys wanted to kill them, right? They wanted to kill them. So they're in this meeting. And so it says this. It says, but when they heard this, the, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaders, when they heard about these guys out preaching again, he says, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. They were going to kill Peter and the disciples for preaching about Jesus. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Can you imagine being wanting people want to kill you because you preach Jesus? Well, there's a lot of countries you go to today, they will kill you for it. Just because it believes, you know, they're not killing us here, doesn't mean it's not happening. People are brothers and sisters throughout the world are being persecuted in the name of Jesus. You can say, thank you, Lord, that I live here in Belize, that I can meet freely in this place. And there's going to come a time when that's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, when I was teaching at the school for years, I would tell the students many times at the school, I would say, what I'm sharing with you right now, if I was in my country, they would throw me in jail. They said, we're telling us about God. I go, yes, we're telling us about God. Because I went to the States and went to a public school and shared Jesus. They would lock me up. You don't think that's persecution? We're telling people about God, that God loves them, that died for them, they, they go to heaven, they believe. Yeah, they throw me in jail for that. Sad, huh? More religious freedom in Belize than my whole country. The Christian nation, the United States of America, right? And it's getting worse. And it's going to get worse. So he intended to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gam Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up to the council and gave orders to the men outside for a short time. He said, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do these men. <clears throat> for some time ago, Didius, whatever his name is, rose up claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined him. But he was killed. And all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, you see, he was giving examples. There were people who had been raised up before, had people following him. They died, and the people dispersed. So he's giving them some, you know, he's sharing with them these things. He says, but in this present case, with Peter and these guys, I say to you, <clears throat> stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. Hey, leave these guys alone. If it's not a God, they'll stop. You know, that's something I learned many years ago. In fact, my pastor taught me early on in the ministry, it, it, with, with, especially with Ann and I in our personal lives. Because Ann and I, in the early years, in the 1980s, remember those years? 1980s, we, we were doing some pretty cutting-edge music. And it was definitely not accepted by Christians. Although it was all about the Lord, but churches didn't like it. And, and my pastor, you know, his board around him said, they, they should stop doing this. They shouldn't be doing this. Because it, that, that music's not right. The drums and all that stuff. And he said, you know what? If this is of God, it'll happen. If it's not, it'll go away. And obviously it was of God. We stayed there and the worship leader of church brought drums right on stage. And that's happened a few times in our life. When my wife started a dance ministry, it was the same thing. They get back there. Dance in church was taboo. Even if you were if you if you were David, the king of Israel, you came into the church in most places in the world and danced, they would have kicked them out. King David. Because they were not understanding the re Dance is of the Lord. You can dance. It's just how you do it. Same thing happened. Our pastor said, you know what? He's standing doing this. If it's of God, we'll go. You know what? It became the biggest ministry in our church. I would say, because of that ministry, hundreds and not thousands of people came to the Lord. It was in order. It was balanced. It was very godly. So that's what he's saying to these guys. And they said, then they said, they took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them. They, they're going to let them go, but they beat them first, right? Isn't that, can you imagine that? Here you kind of, you're going to let them go, but you're going to whip them. 
I don't like that. That's like if you get arrested and you're not getting, you, you know, you didn't even do it, the police whip you before you go. Because I heard that happens, right? And they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council. We, listen, they got beat unjustly. Listen, when I get accused unjust, unjustly, I get really upset. It's very hard for me to stay in the spirit. You know, I, you know, I don't like that to get up when it's not right. But these guys, it says, so they went away from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Wow. And every day in the temple and from house to house they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. They were rejoicing in the fellowship of his suffering. And they just continued doing it. They didn't stop. Wow. 1 Peter 4, 12-14 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fire ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are revived in the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Do, do not be afraid to make a stand for your faith because people are going to come against you. Don't be afraid. Rejoice when they do come against you. Suffering for his name's sake. You will be blessed. God will take care of you. And then he goes on to say, after after that, in, in verse 9 at the end of it, I mean 10, at the end of it, he says, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Wow. You know, Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says, Who, Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with a God to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And we are to be conformed to that death. In other words, we need to die to ourself. Matthew 16, 24 to 26 says, If anyone wishes, Jesus speaking, to come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will a prophet a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul, and what will a man give in exchange for his, his soul? Laying down my life, laying down my will, laying down my desires, laying down my future, laying down my hopes, denying myself, pick up my cross and follow Jesus. Not fulfilling just the things that I want to do, but what does the Lord want to do with my life? What does he want to do with me? Denying yourself. That's dying to self. That's the death. Conforming to his death. That's what he did. He came out of eternity, out of heaven, out of his abode, and became a man, a baby. Not even a man, a baby. In a stinking barn, man. It stuck in there. It smelled. They didn't have Miss Anna going in there with I saw and Miss Maritza going in and cleaning up. It was dirty. He died to himself. And he went to the cross and died for us. Being conformed to his death, in verse 11, number five of these five things, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. You see, there's an awesome resurrection coming for you, for I, for those who have passed before us. You know, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be with the Father. And I believe that. You know, when you go to sleep, you die as a Christian. You're with, you're with the Father immediately. But, right now, when you die, you're not going to have your body. Your body decays here. It goes in the grave, it dies. But, boosh, you know, it's in the spirit. You're there, right? It remains until... The rapture, which we believe here at Calvary Chapel, when the Lord calls us and takes us home. 
And what happens is, if you have passed on, or your, your loved ones have passed on, their bodies in the grave, it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 18, I have to read it to you. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. He doesn't, see, he says fallen He doesn't even say the people who died. He says those who fell asleep in Christ. They didn't die. Their body just passed on. They fell asleep in Christ. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. You see, there's going to be a day when the Lord comes back. He's going to call His people to Himself with the sound of a trump and boom, His people are going to go with Him. That day is coming. So there's some people that will not see a physical death. And I believe, probably a lot of people in this room, I believe, aren't going to see a physical death. I think Jesus is going to come back and take deep waters. I've been, old, been waiting for a long time. I keep getting older and older. So, you know, I know I've, been, I've been waiting now to experience that physical death. But as time goes on, I'm going, you're getting close. I think. It's not operating properly anymore. Right, Benjamin? <coughs> Benjamin is doing some massage on my neck to get me working. He says, he says, turn your neck to the I turn over, he goes, well, you still got to go that much further. I go, what? Not working right. Well, he's going to come back. And he says then, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, those who have fallen asleep, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. The word caught up there is where we get the word rapture from. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This, this is what the Bible says. I, I don't, didn't make this up. I, you know, I don't come here and tell you. We're going to fly right up in the sky. Well, that's what it says. He's going to go. He's going to go. Here we go. And the dead in Christ, those who have fallen asleep before us, are going to come out of their grave in their new spiritual bodies. Our bodies are going to get transformed, which I'm going to read you a scripture about in a, in a moment. And we're going to go. In, I guess they come out of the grave about when they get to us. We whoop, and all of us together, we can go right in the air. Whoo! Whoa! If we will be with them forever. That's what the Bible says. And you cannot say, well, that can't really be real. This part of the Bible is not real. No, no. The whole Bible is 100% God's Word. It's going to happen. Wow. I love it. It says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's comforting to me knowing that we don't actually are going to have to die. Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 50-53. Speaking of this same thing here, it says, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. See, this can't go to heaven because this is flesh and blood. It's evil, it's sinful, you know, it's flesh. Not allowed in heaven. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Because it's perishable, it can't be imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. You know, mystery is something that's not known yet, right? He says, we will not all sleep. We will not all die. God's word. We will not all sleep. But we will all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. That's why I was telling you about that. We will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. See, we're going to, be, we're going to get a body like Jesus had when he came out of the grave. We're going to get that kind of a body that will last forever imperishable. I like that. Hopefully he's got more hair. How are you on? All Christians from all ages, all Christians from all ages will be together on that day. All of us together. Those who have passed on, those who have passed on, guess what? They're waiting for that day too. They're waiting for that day to get in a new body and so up you go. If you want to know more about that and what's going on with that, you know, uh, we're doing Revelation on, on uh, Sunday evenings, and we've been looking at, after this event happens, what happens on the earth down here for the next seven years after 
we are taken out. And evil is unleashed in this world like never before. We get a new body. So Paul, in this scripture here that we're looking at today, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, he's saying, you know, whatever the path the Lord has for me, he's looking forward to that day. He's looking forward to that day when he may attain to the resurrection of the dead. And this is his prayer. This is, this is the climax of his life. This is what he's looking forward to. And I would say you and I as Christians, that's a good thing to be looking forward in your life. Circle these verses. Pray these verses. Listen to them again. Paul says, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Wow. Wow. Lord Jesus. I would pray that would be our prayer. That Lord, we would want to know you more in a deeper way. In an intimate way, Lord. Spiritually deep, Lord. Because I know, Lord, when that happens, we even want to know you more and more and more, Lord. It's endless. It's like eating a good burrito, Lord. You just want more and more. We even just want more of you in our life. There's that song we sing, more of you, more power, Lord. More of you in our lives. That we can know you in that way. Lord, that we could understand the power of your resurrection and, and Lord, that we would really grasp what it means to have that fellowship of suffering, Lord. That it is a good thing. And in the end, it will be wonderful. I pray for us, Lord. That we would have the heart that Paul had. Right now, this year, 2019, going into 2020, that our life would be centered around you, Jesus that others can know you. Because I know, Lord, when that happens, our lives change and people will desire to have what we have. And all we have is you, Lord. And that's all we need. So thank you so much for your word, the encouragement of your word. And Father, go before us. Use us this week to minister, to touch others, Lord. Draw them into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and sing one more song.